Thank you, Douglas, for that very generous introduction. And thank you all for coming out tonight. It's great to see so many people interested in hearing about science. Um, so as you heard, I am a neuroscientist. That means um, my job is to try and work out how the brain functions. More importantly, it means that I get to work out uh, what and, and how the brain malfunctions. And tonight I'm going to uh, speak about something that you just heard mentioned there. I'm going to speak about what happens when perhaps uh, the brain undergoes the most catastrophic malfunction of all, and that is um, when it becomes vegetative. Now, um, you cannot possibly have escaped in recent years seeing something in the news media about the vegetative state. Uh, just in the last couple of years, we've seen uh, a pill, or we've seen a report of a pill that reverses the vegetative state. Um, we've seen patients that have recovered after something close to 20 years in a vegetative state. And this is my favourite one over here on the right. Whoops. Um, that was good, wasn't it? <laughs> um, over here on the right, coma victim. Uh, this woman, uh, she was in a, a vegetative state apparently for six years. Before she woke up, she chatted to her family. She appeared on local television before slipping back into unconsciousness after three days. I think that could only happen in America. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I'm going to disappoint you, and I'm going to start by telling you that all of these things are inaccurate. None of this stuff actually happens in the real world. Uh, we don't have a pill that reverses the vegetative state, unfortunately. Um, it's extremely rare, if ever the case, that somebody in a vegetative state could possibly recover after 20 years. Uh, and I certainly don't know of a single case of somebody who was in a vegetative state and woke up for long enough to go on television before slipping back into a vegetative state. But what I am going to tell you, are, uh, as much as I know about this strange and mysterious disorder, and hopefully I can convince you that in many ways the facts are stranger than the fiction. So my story starts about 15 years ago when I met a young woman uh, in Cambridge in the UK whose name was Kate. When I say I met Kate, um, the circumstances of our meeting were rather unusual. She was uh, admitted to the neurointensive care unit at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge where I was then working and she had been in a vegetative state for about four months. My colleagues and I decided that we would put Kate into a brain scan. In those days we used a technique called positron emission tomography, or PET. Some of you, I'm sure, will have heard about that. And it shows how the brain functions. Or it shows which parts of the brain are still functioning. And what we decided to do was to show Kate pictures of the faces of her family and friends to see what would happen. Now, of course, we expected nothing at all to happen because Kate had been diagnosed as being in a vegetative state, and that meant that her doctors thought that she felt nothing, she was not aware of where she was, who she was, what had happened to her. She should have no thoughts whatsoever. In the scanner, we saw really quite a different story. Now, the back of Kate's brain, which you can see on the left-hand side here, lit up like a Christmas tree, when she was seeing pictures of faces of her family and friends. And of course, this was extremely surprising at the time. Now, we know from many years of neuroscientific studies, from studying patients that have damage to this area of the brain, and also of brain imaging studies in healthy volunteers like all of you here, that this part of the brain at the back is exactly the part that is involved in seeing and remembering faces. So this was a very curious result. Kate, who, as far as we could see, and as far as all of her doctors were aware, was entirely vegetative, yet when we put her into scan her, in the scanner, her brain responded normally to pictures of her friends' and family's faces, much like any of your faces would, um, would, would activate your brains. But what did it mean? Well, uh, did it mean that Kate was actually conscious of everything going on around her and was trapped in a lifeless body? Or is this some sort of automatic brain response? Was this just something that the brain automatically 
fires off and, and parts of it activate that recognise faces and Kate was entirely unaware of everything going on around her. And those questions framed my research for really the next 15 years. And the, the sort of central question that um, I've tried to pursue revolves around how could any of us know that a patient like this, or indeed anybody we know, any of us, anybody else, is actually conscious and aware? And the answer to that question is extremely difficult to answer unless that person is both willing and able to tell you. A much easier question to answer is um, how you can determine that somebody else is awake. And when we talk about consciousness and when we study consciousness, we tend to think of two different components, a, wakeful, a wakefulness component and an awareness component. When you think of somebody becoming unconscious, typically you'll think of them falling asleep, closing their eyes, but also la losing awareness of what's going on around them. And these two things are quite different, wakefulness and awareness. Wakefulness actually is quite easy to assess because I can just look at you. And if your eyes are open, then it's a pretty sure bet that you are awake. But awareness isn't like that. I can't actually look at you or look at a patient and know that that person is awake. Even if your eyes are is aware, sorry, even if your eyes are open, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're aware of what is going on around you. So how would I say my problem is to find out which of you in the audience is aware? How would I go about solving that problem? Well, the honest truth is I would just have to ask you. I'm going to do a, a demonstration now to show you um, the basic principles, and this will become very relevant a bit later in my talk. So what I want you to do is to, I want you all to do exactly what I say, okay? So if you are conscious, please raise your left hand. That's a relief, good, <laughs> right. Okay, now I'm gonna make it slightly more difficult. We'll do it one more time. Listen very carefully to what I say. If you are conscious, please raise your right hand. Excellent. Right, it was fun, wasn't it? <laughs> now, what you've all done is convinced me that you're all aware and conscious. And the reason is because you've done what clinically we call command following. So I issued a command or a request, an instruction to raise your, one of your hands. You all did it. You obviously therefore understood what I was asking to do and you were able to produce an action. And that's what we call command following. And command following is absolutely central to knowing that somebody is aware. I'm sure you've all seen a medical drama at some point, uh, ER or house, or whether the doctor will take hold of the patient's hand and say, move your hand if you can hear what I'm saying. Well, the doctor is looking for there is evidence of command following. If the patient moves the hand, then they know that the patient is aware, aware of where they are and who they are and, and what's going on. So command following is absolutely crucial to knowing that another human being is aware. Okay, now, with you, with everybody in this room, really it wasn't that necessary for me to get you all to raise your arm to know that you're aware. You all came here today, um, you all laughed at a joke I made five minutes ago, you're, you're, you are engaging in this, uh, this public lecture. So you, you, must be, you must be aware, really. This couldn't really have happened unless you'd been aware. But what about patients who we have no circumstantial evidence for that they are actually aware? And the vegetative state is exactly that type of problem. So this is a video of a, a rather well-known vegetative patient. I'm not showing you this because I want to convince you that she was or she wasn't aware. That's actually completely irrelevant to uh, the point I'm about to make. Uh, I'm showing you this because it's been very widely distributed on the internet by her family and therefore I can, I can show you this patient without invading anybody's privacy. So this patient was very typically vegetative. If I just try, there's a very short video. Uh, and it shows you what, really, I think it illustrates what is so mysterious about these patients. And that is that it's not that they don't behave. They do actually produce behaviours. They are quite animate. So in this case, she appears to be waking up. It almost appears as though she's responding to perhaps something else in the room. 
And this is very typical of the vegetative state. So this is not coma. Some of you may have heard coma and vegetative state used interchangeably. That's a mistake that's often made. Coma, a coma patient will appear to be completely asleep with their eyes closed. Vegetative patients have what we call sleeping and waking cycles. They'll often wake up and they'll often fall asleep. They'll do things like yawn. Um, and they have very basic reflexes, but crucially, they'll never produce any actual responses to any external stimulation. And that's what's so mysterious and perplexing about it. So in this case, although some of you may have thought, well, perhaps there's something going on in the room, maybe she's following somebody, that never actually happens in the vegetative state. They will look around the room, but they won't actually look at something in particular. They won't follow somebody with their eyes. You can't attract a patient's attention by perhaps putting a, a loud noise over on one side of the head. No responses at all. And that's really, that's really crucial to the diagnosis. So I, I'm hoping that I've told you two things so far, and I now want you to put them together. So the first thing is, that in order for anybody to demonstrate that they are conscious and aware, even you lot, you have to produce a response. You have to command follow. And then I've told you that vegetative patients, by definition, cannot respond. They cannot produce any responses. They cannot command follow. Therefore, isn't it logically the case that if a patient, just say you had a patient who was conscious and was aware, but was incapable of any movement, was incapable of generating any responses, wouldn't we think they were vegetative because that person would have no possibility for convincing us otherwise? And that's the sort of thorny clinical problem that my team and I have been wrestling with uh, for the last 10 years or so. We, we believed that it must be the case that patients must exist that are really are trapped inside their bodies and incapable of demonstrating that they are conscious. But we, because we rely, in order to measure awareness and consciousness, we rely so fundamentally on the ability to produce a response, we would have had no way of detecting these patients up until uh, very recently. So, how are we going to solve this problem? We've got patients that can't respond that we think might be conscious and uh, we have no way of assessing their consciousness. Well, we turned to a technique, another brain imaging technique known as um, fMRI or functional magnetic resonance imaging. And this involves no radiation at all. Um, and what we do is we scan patients and we try and determine on the basis of their brain activity alone whether they are conscious or not. Now this technology is absolutely fantastic. Um, it's one of the reasons I've come to Western because it's even more fantastic at Western than it is in almost everywhere else. Um, this is a real person you're looking at. I just want to point this out. This is not a cartoon. This is, a, this is an MRI image that's been turned into a three-dimensional reconstruction of somebody's head. Uh, typically, if you knew who that person is, it's often possible to recognize them based on the MRI image of their head. Hair doesn't come out in the MRI. Um, but what we can do is we can actually slice, obviously virtually, this is not real, we can slice, <laughs> slice the top of people's heads off and look at the brain actually doing its thing, being active or otherwise, inside the head while the person is still in the scanner. This now can happen all in real time. And we use what's actually quite a basic principle in neuroscience, and that is that when you imagine doing something, when you imagine doing some things, the parts of your brain that activate are the same parts that would activate if you were to actually do that thing. Now, it doesn't work for everything, but for some things it works really well. So if you imagine moving, for example, if you were to imagine moving your hand uh, like this, what you, your arm like this, what you'll do is you'll activate an area called the premotor cortex. It's right across here. It happens in everybody, and that's because this is the area that's involved in preparing to move. When you decide you're going to wave your arm around, this part of the brain, the premotor cortex, sends a signal to the motor cortex saying, right, let's get ready, we're going to move. 
So even if you don't actually move, that signal still gets sent. You still get a message from the premotor cortex. We don't see anything in the motor cortex that actually moves your arms because, of course, you didn't move. But you do see that alerting signal from the premotor cortex. Now, that's interesting. We, we can use that as a form of command following. And that's what we do. What we, do we, we give people a game, if you like, to play in order to get them to imagine moving their arms. We tell them, we want, them, we want you to imagine playing tennis. It's very simple, but it turns out that absolutely everybody, if you just put them in the scanner and you say, imagine playing tennis, they all do something like that. You can see I'm not a very good tennis player, but it's something, it involves waving your, there's no way of playing tennis without waving your arm in the air somehow. And when we tell our healthy volunteers uh, or, or our patients to do this, what happens is we see activation here in the premotor cortex. And this is this area of the brain sending the signal, and remember they're not actually moving, they're lying completely stationary in the scanner, but the premotor cortex is sending a signal to the motor cortex to say, right, we've got to move, get ready to move. And when you tell people to just relax, this signal gradually disappears. You'll see activity here in the premotor cortex gradually fading away. Now this is really useful because we can use this just like an arm movement. It's just like we would say, just like I said to you, raise your arm if you're conscious. We could say, well, imagine playing tennis or activate your premotor cortex if you're conscious. And isn't that, isn't that command following? You know, there's not an actual action, you're not moving your arm, but it doesn't matter if we know where the activity should be in that, in that special band of cortex in the premotor cortex, and it happens exactly when we say do it, isn't that formally identical to asking somebody to move their hand? Well, this is the, that was the sort of, uh, the, those are the sort of pilot studies that we put together to try and make what I'm about to show you work. Um, and we set about, when we knew that this worked, in every healthy volunteer we tried it, and everybody we asked to imagine playing tennis would activate uh, their premotor cortex, we set about trying to do this in patients who behaviourally appeared to be entirely uh, vegetative. So, um, what was extraordinary about the story I'm going to tell you now is that this was the very first patient we tried this in. Now, science moves along rather more slowly than I think most of us would like to, and the, the part I've already told you took several years to get to this point where we were completely confident that we could map activity in the premotor cortex and we, we knew what we were looking for. Um, it, it was some years before we were able to say, well, OK, we're ready, now let's try this in a patient. And it, it was a simple decision. We said, well, the next patient that comes into the hospital who uh, is diagnosed as being in a vegetative state, we'll, we'll try this and we'll just ask her to imagine playing tennis. And I don't think anything could have prepared us for what happened. So this is a different, uh, this is the same brain scan you've just seen. Instead of putting it in three dimensions, I'm just showing you a picture from the side here. I'm going to shout. So this is, it is as though we've sort of split the brain down the middle here. Actually, I'll face, it's that way. Uh, the eyes are over here. This is the, the back of the brain. That's the cerebellum some of you will know about. That's called the corpus callosum. That's the connective tissue between the two sides of your brain. Um, so imagine that we've cut the brain down the middle there and you're looking at the so from the side into the middle. That's the premotor cortex, so it's about, about here. And that big blob is what happens in, what would happen in any of you when you were imagining playing tennis in our scanner. And this is what we saw in this young woman. Now this woman was, uh, she had been in a road traffic accident. She was a pedestrian, she'd been hit by uh, two cars um, whilst crossing the road using a mobile phone. Uh, she had a terrible accident. Uh, some of you, if you know anything about brain imaging, you can see uh, the results of some of the damage here at the front of her head. She doesn't have the normal rounded skull that the healthy volunteer has. But what's most important is that the activity when we asked her to imagine playing tennis was in exactly the same area of the brain as the healthy volunteers. Now this didn't just happen once, it happened every time we asked her to imagine playing tennis. This area activated. And then when we said stop, the area stopped activating. Despite the fact that outside of the scan or before the scan, this woman had produced no responses whatsoever. If you asked her to move her hand, she would do nothing. But in the scanner, she could activate her brain at will exactly when we asked her to do it. 
And it's not only one thing that she could do, she could actually do many different things. Uh, a bit like I, I asked you to raise your left arm, then raise your right arm, that's because, um, again, I wanted to make absolutely sure this wasn't, wasn't some sort of automatic response and you'd raise your left arm, whatever it is I said to you. So to really know that you understood the instruction, I had two different instructions. With her, we did the same thing. So uh, another, another type of task, another type of imagery task that we used, is to ask her to imagine moving from room to room in her house. This is, this is a task that psychologists typically call uh, spatial navigation. And it doesn't matter whether you move around the rooms of your house in your head or whether you travel out in the street from where you work to where you live. As long as you are thinking about moving around a, a, an area or a location that you are familiar with, you will see a network of brain activity that's quite different to this, and it involves areas mostly in the back of the brain. This is called the parietal cortex. This one's called the parahippocampal gyrus. It's deep down, right? Some of you may have heard about this. This, this, this area was in the news a few years ago because it turns out that taxi drivers have a very well-developed parahippocampal gyrus, and the reason is because they spend so much time trying to work, work out how to get from A to B. Uh, and if you just think about getting from A to B, you don't have to actually do it, you activate these regions of the brain. And our patient, again, um, our woman who appeared to be entirely vegetative, activated all of the same parts of the network. Um, every part of the brain that's activated in a healthy, walking, talking individual activated in this woman when um, we asked her to imagine moving from room to room in her house. So now, Think about the two arms, we've got both, right? She's both able to do one thing, raise her left arm, and then do another thing, raise her right arm. But in her case, we're asking her to activate her premotor cortex or activate the back of her brain. And again, she did this repeatedly every time we asked her to do this. So on this basis, we, we concluded, unfortunately, this woman clearly wasn't in a vegetative state, even though the clinical evidence was 100% in that direction, that she, she appeared to be entirely vegetative. We concluded that she couldn't be. In fact, she was entirely conscious. And we did that because she was command following. She could repeatedly respond to commands and respond, differentiate between different kinds of commands. Now, that was quite a controversial claim at the time, um, not least because she was only one patient. And bizarrely, she was the first patient that we'd ever, we'd ever tried this on. And actually, at the time, to me, that made it really obviously the case that there must be more patients like this. It, I, I didn't believe it could possibly be that the one patient who can do this in the entire world happened to be in the same town that I was in when I asked people to imagine playing tennis. So it was pretty obvious, but at the time, there was a lot of newspaper pub publicity and... Uh, you know, some of it was, um, you know, well, it was all very cautious and conservative as, as it should be. But um, I think we all knew at that time that this was really the beginning of, uh, of something much bigger. And over the next, next couple of years, we scanned as many patients as we possibly could in three different centres um, around Europe, uh, trying to see whether there were more patients and if so, how many. And we published that uh, last year, um, the results of that study. We had 23 patients who were clinically appeared to be absolutely vegetative, and, and uh, four of them, about 17% of these patients, could produce these responses to command. So that's very important because um, I don't want you to go away thinking that I think that all vegetative patients are actually conscious. I don't think that at all. Um, I think most of them probably are exactly uh, what we all think and, and hope they are, which is vegetative and not aware of anything that's going on around them. But a significant minority, close to 20%, are actually not what they appear to be at all, but are something else, uh, in fact, uh, something that we don't have a name for. We have no clinical name for a condition in which somebody is, can appear to be entirely vegetative but could actually be entirely conscious at the same time. So the next question, really the last, the last thing I'm going to, to talk about is, you know, what, what can we do about that? What, um, what was the next thing we did? And uh, I'll end by then telling you where, where we're going from here and what we're doing at Western at the moment. So the big question really 
for these patients, this small group of patients that we'd identified was, well, can we actually communicate with somebody? Can we actually make contact? It's all very well having people imagining playing tennis, but that's not really, uh, it's not very useful for them, uh, as interesting as it might be for us. And the next, uh, what I'm going to show you now is actually, it's, it's a pretty small step. And, you know, in many ways, it's quite an obvious step. And I'm sure many of you have already thought about it, if you haven't, uh, if, even if you haven't read about this already. And a very simple way of turning this into a, a rather rudimentary communication tool is to put somebody in the scanner and say, well, if you want to say yes, imagine playing tennis. And if you want to say no, imagine moving from room to room in your house. And then we can look for the activation patterns and determine whether they're saying yes or no in response to a particular question. Just to uh, illustrate how easy this is, um, I, how easy it is to make this work, I'll, I'll, I'll show you a healthy volunteer before I talk about any patients. So this is, again, in fact, one of the very first people we ever tried this in. We do this often now, um, in part because it's fun and in part because uh, it's a, I think it's a very good demonstration of the power of neuroimaging and the sorts of things that we can do uh, with scanners like the one we have here at Western in real time while people are still in the scanner. So this was a friend of mine, um, well, so it was a colleague of mine who I, I, I knew personally but didn't know anything about her background. I didn't know what her husband's name was or her father's name. Or, uh, and, and I asked her to give me a list of names and uh, a list of relationships that she had with people. And my task was to try and read her brain try and guess you know, what her husband's name is, for example, based solely on her brain activity. So she lay in the scanner, she said absolutely nothing, um, but all she knew, the only instruction she had beforehand was, if you want to say yes, imagine playing tennis. So that's what happened when I said, is your husband called Charlie? Uh, not very much, you should be getting used to these images now. We're looking for activity over here, and if she's imagining playing tennis, this is where we would see the activity. So it doesn't look like her husband was called Charlie. This is what happened when I said, is your husband called Terry? Now, not a lot of activity, but it's definitely there in that critical region, in the premotor cortex. And it lit up, when I said, is your husband called Terry? The premotor cortex started to light light up. Now on that basis, I know that she's imagining playing tennis and she's imagining playing tennis because she's trying to say yes, because that's the instruction she's got. And while she was still in the scanner, I pressed the intercom and I said, right, I think your husband's called Terry. And fortunately for me, I was correct. Her husband is called Terry. Now, if you're skeptical, and believe me, some of our reviewers on our papers are skeptical, you might you might say, well, yes, but you know, she loves her husband. And this is some sort of automatic brain response. Every time she hears his name, she sort of gets a bit wobbly, and the premotor cortex probably activates. I've heard all of these arguments, believe me. Um, welcome to my life. Um, this is why we have control conditions in science. Uh, and of course, there's a very easy control condition you can do here. You can say, for example, is your dog called Terry? Now, if this is an automatic response to her husband's name, the name Terry, we should see the same activity in the premotor cortex. And it doesn't happen because her, her dog's name is not Terry. So when she, when she had this question, she didn't start imagining playing tennis because she didn't want to say yes. And of course, the fourth condition, is your, is your dog called Charlie? Well, the whole premotor cortex, I know what you're thinking. Um, <laughs> Yes, I don't know the answer either. I'm not a social psychologist, but um, I'll leave that to somebody else to, for somebody else to figure out. So it doesn't really matter how much activity there is. It's in the right place. It's in the same place as the husband. She's activating this because her dog is called Charlie, and she's enthusiastically conveying a yes because uh, she's imagining playing tennis. So we are brain reading. She's doing nothing. She's saying nothing. She's lying in the scanner. And we can answer these questions by, admit, by giving these yes, uh, yes and no questions. So last year, um, last year we came across um, another patient who had been vegetating. And again, um, I feel like I'm only telling you about our really remarkable cases, but this, this chat was was remarkable because he had been in a vegetative state for five years. Again, he was uh, what we call a traumatic brain injury. He had been involved in a road traffic accident. For five years, he'd been seen by many doctors repeatedly, and he'd been repeatedly diagnosed as being in a vegetative state. So the reason I give you this detail is because 
you know, I want you to go away knowing that we don't select these patients as being special or as being particularly likely to activate. Or, you know, he, he was just another, for us, another patient in a series of patients. But admittedly, he had, uh, he had been in the vegetative state for much longer than most of the patients that we see. When we asked him to imagine playing tennis, that's what we saw on the left. When we asked him to imagine moving from room to room in his house, that's what we saw. Now, hopefully, you can all tell it's completely different. Here we're seeing activation in his premotor cortex. There's that taxi driver area, the parahippocampal gyrus activating in response to him imagining moving from room to room in his house. So we knew he was conscious, and then we moved on to see whether we could ask him some questions. And while he was still in the scanner on the same occasion, we said, OK, if you want to say yes, imagine playing tennis. If you want to say no, imagine moving from room to room in your house. We then started the scan and we asked him a series of very straightforward biographical questions because, I mean, this was like a completely brave new world for us. We had no idea this was going to work. We couldn't ask him ambiguous questions. We had to ask things that we didn't know the answer to, but that we could subsequently verify as being yes or no responses. So we had his family, much as we did with the, uh, the friend of mine that I've already described to you, we had his family give us names of possible relatives, uh, names of possible places he'd been on vacation in the last five years, uh, sorry, in the, pr the previous five years prior to his accident. Uh, and we set about asking him questions and guessing. We said things like, is your father's name Thomas? We didn't know the answer. Uh, this is what we saw when we said, is your father's name Thomas? Now you might think this is exactly the same scan as that. It isn't. It's an entirely different time. But that is what happens when he imagines moving from room to room in his house. That's what happens when he's answering the question, is your father's name Thomas, when he knows that to convey a no, he has to imagine moving from room to room in his house. Hopefully, you don't need to be a brain imaging expert to be able to see that his father's name is not Thomas. When we asked a slightly different question, however, when we asked, is your father's name Alexander, that's what we saw. Completely different pattern, and hopefully you agree, it's almost identical to this pattern over here, and that's because he's imagining playing tennis. He knows he has to imagine playing tennis to convey a yes, and his father's name was Alexander. And he managed to answer five questions in a row like this, five questions that we subsequently verified with his family uh, the, the correct answers. So not only is this patient conscious, he's more than that, he's actually able to answer yes and no questions about his personal life. Things that we could not possibly uh, have known, and hopefully you'd agree, this wasn't something that was terribly difficult, this wasn't an ambiguous response, it was really bright and clear. Now again, you may still be sceptical, you may be worried about using brain imaging to decide whether somebody wants to say yes or no, and I completely understand that point of view. Um, you may think, well, you only asked five questions. Is that really enough to be absolutely sure? But imagine that, imagine I were to come into the audience, I barely met any of you, I don't know any of, anything about your backgrounds, and I were to ask you five biographical questions that had yes and no answers, and you answered five of them correctly, I think I would be justified in concluding that you were conscious and you were aware and you were a he moderately healthy, sentient human being that knew where they were uh, and, and, uh, you know, and, and the, situation, uh, the situation that they were in. And that's, that, that's exactly the criterion we used for him. We just used exactly the same criterion that any of us would use to establish that another human being is aware. When you ask somebody questions and they give you the correct answers, it's a reasonable assumption. So whether you're nervous or not, um, I'm quite sure you would have all agreed that if I'd got him to say, raise his left arm for a yes and his right arm for a no, and he'd got five questions in a, in a row right, you would have absolutely, definitely thought he was conscious uh, and aware. And I would argue that what we have here with the brain imaging data is something that's formally identical to that. It's, it's an action, but it's a brain action rather than a bodily action, rather than a traditional form of communication like speech, 
um, he's, he's activating his brain. And of course, in this situation, that's the only possibility that we have for him. And of course, we don't know, just because he can answer yes or no questions, we don't know about his internal mental state. We don't know whether he's depressed. We don't know whether he's unhappy. We don't know whether he wants to live or die. But we have generated or produced a technique that can, with appropriate ethical and um, legal constraints being put in place, can go forward and ask those more difficult uh, and challenging questions. So I'm almost done, two more minutes. Um, I'll just tell you one of the things that's really exciting me about the work that we're doing here, um, uh, here in Western, and that is uh, really to address well, where do, you know, the question, where do we go from here? What are we going to do now? We've discovered this population of patients that are trapped inside their bodies. Some are even able to communicate. What are we going to do about them? Clearly, we can't send people home with an MRI scanner. Um, it's a huge machine, it's terribly expensive, it's very heavy, and it's impossible to imagine a world where these patients will be communicating from scanners in the future. But there are other techniques, um, and one of them, some of you will have heard about, is EEG, or electroencephalography. Now, EEG is much cheaper, um, it's much more portable, as you can see here. Um, you can just put it on your head, and uh, it's not terribly attractive, but uh, it's, very, it's very portable, and it's relati relatively efficient. You can collect data, actually, in many ways, much faster than you can with fMRI. It has some limitations, which I'm not going to bore you with now, but it is possible to, and this is right where we are now, so... Um, you know, I can't, I can't give you too many exciting results because most of them are still a little bit around the corner. But um, this is a, a colleague of mine. This is a healthy volunteer using an EEG to actually control a computer cursor. I'll just play. I'm sorry about the quality of this. This was taken with uh, my mobile phone. So uh, what he's trying to do, he's got an EEG cap here, and he's trying to influence this ball to hit the target. And the target's either at the top or the bottom of the screen. And if you watch it for a while, you'll see he's amazingly successful. I think he only misses one target in total. And he's doing this simply by, imagine, by, by uh, producing imaginary movements uh, with his brain. He's imagining squeezing his hands and squeezing his toes. And by doing that, he's able to make the ball move up and down. Now imagine that this was a yes and this was a no. So he could actually answer questions. And you can see how quickly it's going. He can answer yes and no questions uh, by doing this. Um, you could also perhaps imagine a, um, an even more complicated scenario where somebody could move the ball around a whole series of 26 letters and they could even spell out words. And although it sounds like science fiction, the techniques to do that sort of thing uh, are almost here in healthy volunteers. This has never been tried in a patient that can't produce any other response and that's where that's where our job is going to come in that's what's going to be really uh, uh, really difficult to do but the basic technology is there for doing this sort of thing in healthy volunteers using relatively uh, portable systems like this that you can imagine some way down the line patients taking home and using to uh, communicate on a regular basis but that's for the future, and you'll have to invite me back next year if you want to know what happens. Um, I'll finish by just, let, well, I'll let Kate finish. I told you, I started my talk by talking about Kate, who um, I first met in Cambridge 15 years ago and really started this whole area off by activating her brain in the scanner. Um, we would never have bothered carrying on. I don't think any of us thought there was any point in, in, uh, in investing the time and energy and money in, in this patient group if it had not been um, for Kate. Uh, Kate is extremely remarkable because she's also somebody who went on to make a recovery. Now this is extremely rare, as I said to you at the beginning of my talk, it's very rare for patients to recover. Um, almost a year after um, she arrived in hospital, Kate uh, started to uh, make a recovery. She came out of her vegetative state. She's still very seriously physically disabled. Um, she, uh, she communicates, her speech is very impaired, and she communicates live with people by using a letter board. You can see it here. She points to the letters, and anybody that 
is reasonably proficient or spend any time with her can follow what it is that she's uh, trying to say. Cognitively, Kate is absolutely fine. Her mental functions are right back uh, to where they were. She's actually, uh, she has a very well-developed sense of humour, which is great to see. Because she can do this, she can communicate with a computer. And she often types, and she will still, 15 years on, will still send regular emails to the research team that were with her the day she was scanned uh, back in 1997. And I think some of her emails are absolutely, she manages to nail the issue much better than I ever could. So I'll conclude with an email that she sent me recently. This was after one of the, the, the publicity episodes that Douglas mentioned at the beginning. Um, she'd obviously seen me in the Cambridge newspaper. She said, I saw you in the local newspaper last night. I agree with you about brain scanning. It is so important. It scares me to think of what might have happened if I had not had mine. So please use my case to show people how good they are. I hope I've done that today. I want more people to know about them. It was like magic. It found me. Uh, I've been doing neuroscience for 20 years. Uh, I've been doing brain imaging for most of that time. And honestly, very often it still feels like magic to me. Thanks very much for listening.